Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Galderma. Hello, I'm Jerry Tan from Windsor, Ontario in Canada. I'm a clinical dermatologist and adjunct professor at the University of Western Ontario. Welcome to this program entitled the Burden of Acne Scarring of the Face and Trunk. Joining me today is Professor Lawrence Eichenfield, who is Professor of Dermatology and Pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Welcome and thanks for joining me, Larry. Uh, acne scarring can affect acne patients across the spectrum of acne severity. Even patients with very mild acne can be affected by scarring. The adverse impact of acne scarring on quality of life can be significant, and it can be lifelong based on self-image issues, embarrassment, and frustration. In addition, it can also be problematic for those affected because of stigmatization and attribution of negative traits by others. Larry, can you help by reviewing the factors that lead to a higher risk of acne scarring? Sure, Jerry. Um... I try to translate the risk factors um, into what am I looking for when I'm entering a room with a patient with acne. Um, and so I think the first thing is going to be the severity of the acne. Someone who has more acne, and especially more inflammatory acne, may have more, more chance of, uh, of scarring. And that includes both uh, 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 facial and uh, chest and back disease as well. But there's some other factors that... Um, uh, goes along with the risk as well. For one thing, uh, very young individuals having acne, when we see a nine-year-old who has acne that's way beyond the normal at that point, that actually could correlate with a risk of more scarring acne over time. Um, the types of acne, more nodular acne, can leave uh, more scarring as well. One of the clear risk factors for uh, scarring is the um, timing of effective treatment. So let's, so the, one of the big takeaways from this discussion today will be that we want the appropriate medical therapy to minimize development of scarring and acne. And that sort of reflects our knowledge, which is that if you prevent acne and prevent inflammatory acne and prevent acne that leads to scarring, you'll decrease the amount of scarring. So we want to be, uh, uh, know that that delayed therapy, and we certainly see this in clinical practice, can be associated with word scarring. Physical manipulation is probably a risk factor as well. Um, uh, pick, uh, individuals may think that they're popping pimples outward, but, but there's a downward pressure that probably creates uh, some patient's materials getting into the dermis with more of an inflammatory reaction. And family history, actually not as well studied as it, as it could be, but I think uh, we know that family history of scarring acne is something that can, can, uh, def definitely confers a higher risk of actual scarring. Thanks, Larry. And what are the treatment approaches you would recommend to try to help mitigate some of these risks? Yeah, so I think that um, really the spectrum of acne treatments can all be used individually or together to minimize uh, scarring. So the, the real takeaway is effective treatments is going to minimize your acne lesions. And this includes the range, the range of treatments. It includes topical retinoids, clearly a mainstay uh, to minimize acne and uh, uh, to prevent acne. I'll take a little bit of an aside. You know, we used to think that um, scarring acne all came from very, very inflammatory papules, and that's what left, you know, gels in the skin. But we're much more sophisticated. There have been some studies done that have shown that, that not all scars come from big, impressive inflammatory lesions. And sometimes very subtle lesions can leave uh, a, a scarring in the skin. Um, so retinoids are a mainstay, and they can be monotherapy retinoids. We have our tretinoins, we have a dapoline base, and then we have um, a tazaratine. 
And then we have a new one, which we'll discuss later, trifaritina. Uh, combination medications uh, 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 can be used. Um, there's been some very good studies on the utility of adapalene benzyl peroxide in uh, minimizing uh, the, de uh, the development of scars. And also actually, we'll come back to that, but remodeling uh, uh, scars that have already uh, developed. Systemic antibiotics may have a place as well, hormonal therapies, and then um, isotretinoin, which can be highly uh, successful in people with more severe disease in sort of stopping the disease and minimizing ongoing damage. So I think the spectrum of acne treatments can be used together to minimize the acne and minimize the scarring. I absolutely agree with you, Larry. The, the issue has been, and one of the questions that comes up regularly is, are there any measures to prevent the development of acne? And I agree. I think there are no proven measures to prevent development. But there are a lot of interesting observations that might be of value in exploring this aspect further. I wanted to ask you, as far as acne goes, are there newer treatment options becoming available? Yeah, so um, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, interesting things. We're excited now that we're getting uh, uh, getting some new products. So um, I think across the spectrum, let's start with systemic antibiotics. There's a, a new um, a oral antibiotic uh, uh, called saracycline. It's a sort of new generation of cyclines. We haven't had, it's been decades since we've had a, a new agent. Uh, it's nice to have that. Um, and that's in addition to our normal uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, tetracyclines. There are some uh, a newer topical retinoid, um, a trifaritine. There's a new minocycline foam uh, that's uh, been released. Uh, interesting to try to get uh, way or beyond some of the side effects that we might see with uh, systemic uh, minocycline. Try to uh, um, have it as an uh, antimicrobial topically, though with any antimicrobial uh, other than benzoyl peroxide, you can worry about bacterial resistance uh, uh, coming over time. And then there's a new interesting uh, product, uh, Classicoderone, which is essentially um, um, a, a creating a product that is an uh, androgen antagonist. So it's like you think of hormonal therapies where we try to influence the androgen influence on at the... Um, at the receptor level and influencing the sebaceous gland follicle and the uh, development of acne. And clesoderone actually competes with dihydrotestosterone in terms of the binding of androgen. This is a topical not yet released, but the studies were interesting. It's something that could be uh, interesting to put in our, uh, in our, our armamentarium. But I'm going to put it back to Jerry and say, <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about trafaritine and a brand new type of retinoid? Yes, thanks, Larry. Um, Triferritine was developed as a very specific, very selective RAR gamma retinoic receptor uh, molecule. And through its phase three development studies, it had met its efficacy endpoints in terms of global assessment success, as well as lesion improvement success. But the really unique thing about this particular product and the trials that support this product are that it wasn't just used on the face, it was also used on the torso, the trunk. And that area to be studied to this level of credibility and to be then evaluated and critiqued and uh, eventually approved by the FDA, I think is a real uh, landmark in terms of the design of the study for a topical medication. Topical medications have typically been focused on facial uh, application and targeting of facial acne. This one evaluated not just facial, but also truncal acne and meeting its endpoints in both facial as well as truncal acne improvement. So it was uh, approved by the FDA in the fall of 2019 and it's now commercially available in a number of jurisdictions, including the U.S. So, Jerry, I think it's, um, you, you pointed out, I, I think it's uh, very excited to have the product, but also that they, they took the, uh, made the decision to uh, do the, take the time and energy to study it, uh, study it on the trunk, because while it makes sense, you'd think, you know, scarring acne can have such a psychosocial impact on individuals, but people tend to think facial acne 
But, you know, I have a very large adolescent uh, acne practice and the chest and back acne is a big deal for uh, both our females and males. So our females, they'll, you know, commonly wear, even without a bathing suit, you know, their, their chest is exposed, their upper back's exposed. The males are many times doing sports and stuff. They'll take their shirts off. And this is a big deal. It brings a lot of a, sort of a, a, a shame or discomfort uh, in, uh, and it impacts the relationships with other people. So I think having a, a retinoid that's targeted towards the trunk is something that I'm really excited to have in our armamentarium. And you know, it's interesting because we know that truncal acne affects at least half the patients who present to us sure. with facial acne, sure. but it's been so understudied in the past. So I'm glad we're now shedding more light and trying to help patients that way also. Yeah. So, so I'll point out that, that um, it is a strange thing that we don't really know why it is that some patients come in with tremendously uh, involved facial acne and not much on the chest and trunk and others come in with everything involved and others come in with like very little facial acne and chest and trunk. We've been doing acne a long time. You think we know what the predictive factors are, but you know, so there's a lot of work to do yet. <laughs> totally agree. Um, and speaking about acne and also the sequelae of acne, including scarring, could you help review some of the device-based and otherwise procedural-based treatment options for patients presenting with scarring? Yeah, I'll start with the takeaway. The takeaway is that we want medical therapy to minimize the development of scarring acne, but there's a huge set of techniques, some of which are incredibly helpful at modulating already established acne. So first of all, Retinoid combinations and retinoids themselves can remodel some acne. There was a really good study done with uh, um, 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 a combination of, you know, bezel peroxide, uh, adapalene. It was a, uh, uh, which did a very good job at showing that not that with the use, it was a split face study. They showed that they decreased the development of scars with that combination as compared to vehicle, but they also decreased the number of small atrophic scars, the medium size uh, scars. So there's some degree of remodeling that can come with just medical therapy, uh, especially with retinoid combinations and retinoids. But the surgical side, fractionated CO2, there's subcision where you sort of lift up the, the scar. There's the use of trichloroacetic acid, what's called the cross technique, where you're sort of poking in and causing inflammatory reaction. There's um, a variety of surgical techniques with excisions of scars, and then there's stuff that who knows how well it works, including microneedling, P, you know, PRP. Um, uh, I think there's a whole set of procedural dermatology that can really help with acne scarring. And I think rather effectively and can really help individuals' psyche if they've had scarring acne. But the big takeaway is that if we do a really good job with our medical acne management, we won't need that. And that's a much easier way to manage patients. I completely agree. And, you know, it's... Um... It's based on the notion that no acne, no scars, or treat acne early, minimize scars. And your comment about the uh, Oscar study, the combination, fixed dose combination of daphne BPO, brings to mind another study that was done just with a daphne by itself in patients who only had acne scarring, no active acne. So the question then is, in the presence of acne scarring, atrophic acne scarring, can a topical retinoid make a difference to the scars? And this was a study conducted at Johns Hopkins about and published about two, three years ago that demonstrated that um, over a course of six months, adapting 0.3% improved the clinical appearance of the scars so that the overall scar global assessments were markedly improved. And importantly, they followed up with immunohistochemical studies that demonstrated an increase in pro-collagen and collagen levels underneath the skin. What that suggests to me is that in patients who have scarring, using a topical retinoid is really important for two reasons. One is you can start by helping them with their scars right off the bat. Number two, and, and some of the reason for that is because of collagen formation, probably elastic tissue formation, and then deposition of hyaluronic acid slash glycosaminoglycans, because we know those are all retinoid effects on the skin. 
But the second and really other important point that maybe isn't clear is that once your fibroblast machinery is turned on to make dermal matrix, and then you add on other repair mechanisms, microneedling, radiofrequency microneedling, fractionated lasers, and so forth, perhaps as your factory is turned on, now you're going to drive it to work overtime and generate even more repair capacity. So I think that's where the topical retinoids have a, an unmet need, previously unknown, that we could use to the advantage to help patients improve the scarring even more effectively, whether it's by itself or in the context of using some of these procedural treatments. I totally agree, Jerry, and I think it's something that we sort of we've we've sort of changed our our knowledge base because of those studies and um, and this concept that you you have a scar it's scarred forever is it really the case? And retinoids can be really useful in our armamentarium. I totally agree. One of the questions that comes up is: Do the range of treatments for facial scarring differ for truncal scarring? What are your thoughts, Larry? Well, I, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, the qualities of the scars vary, of course, in terms of truncal scarring. I mean, we have keloidal scars on the trunk very commonly, which have to be managed in a totally different, uh, different way, um, rather than yeah, as compared to small atrophic scars that we sometimes see on the face tends to be less common on the trunk. So I, I think that, that at that point, you need to sort of assess what's the quality of the lesions and then decide how to intervene. I completely agree. For example, um, ice pick scars. We see that so frequently in facial acne scarring. And even with very close looking, I don't see that very often on truncal acne. And I don't know why that is. But, you know, with some of the very specific lesional scar treatments, TCA cross, for example, or specific fillers, I tend to do that much less frequently for truncal acne, atopic acne scarring than for facial. And maybe it's also because on the face, people are so focused on any smaller area of imperfection that they want specific lesions and then the field options to improve the whole background of the skin as well. So on the trunk, I end up doing a lot of field options and field options I think of as radiofrequency microneedling or fractionated laser or peels as opposed to spot treatments with TCA cross or fillers. That makes sense, less of an individual lesion approach. That... I think so, exactly. So I wanted to conclude with the following three major points. Acne scarring, whether it's on the face or trunk, can have significant negative impact on patients due to a direct quality of life impact and due to stigmatization. Number two, Acne scarring can be minimized with early effective treatment of acne. And number three, both facial and truncal acne can be successfully treated with topical as well as oral medications and sometimes a combination of both. New advances in acne medications will allow for greater individualization of therapy for our acne patients. Larry, thank you so much for joining me in this activity. And thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow to complete the evaluation.